we are live. All right, we are live. Okay, we want to welcome everybody to the Doctors Are In. We are in for a treat tonight. We've opened up a brand new topic here on uh, for the month of September, dealing with the divine feminine, patriarchy, and um, in some of its implications relating to um, uh, male dominance and, and oppression. And uh, so anyway, we're going to get into that. But just so that people who are joining us for the first time, you might want to know what we're all about. So I'm going to share my screen here in just a second to kind of give you an idea of what we are all about. Pardon me as we trying to make, trying to navigate technology and at the same time trying to give you an idea as to what we're all about. I'm going to share my screen so that you have an idea of what we're about. Welcome to the Doctors Are In. I'm here with my panel, as we're colleagues together in this quest for liberation, this quest for the truth, the truth that's in Jesus, the truth that transcends a God that was given to us to the God that liberates. Anyway, we have Dr. Thomas L. Brown, based out of Indianapolis, Indiana. We have Bishop F. Janine Hyman, based out of Richmond, Virginia. And you have myself, as based out of the Phoenix, Arizona area. Panel tonight, how y'all feeling in the house? In the house? Uh, I was tired, and you know why. <laughs> <laughs> tired, honey, tired. Uh, but it is a, a very good uh, tire, you know, when you have um, uh, busted a movement um, in the spirit realm and in the earth realm and uh, your mission and your ministry and your woman or manhood uh, all begin to line up with heaven. And, uh, you know, you're getting some things done. And whenever you're pioneering something, uh, you double tie it because you've got to, uh, you know, create a trajectory or go back and, and dig up an old one and reestablish it. So um, just having finished with the apostle Stephen Gardner um, and some others, um, our gathering of the remnant in Richmond, Virginia, uh, both of us are probably tired. <laughs> well, I, I, it was a good tire, you know, it was a good tire. So sometimes you need those kind of retreats to break away that you can get your breakthrough, that you can break back in, you know, to 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 pave the way for others. Um, Dr. Brown, 
all the way. Well, I'm, I'm doing what the uh, folk would say in the country. I'm fairly middling. I'm fairly middling. And listening to you all, it sounds like you all were getting recharged. Uh, you were being charged. And, and since you say you're tired, no, you're being recharged spiritually and you are physically tired. But All spiritually, right. spiritually, there is no tiredness. Spiritually, there's an eternal ongoing of energy. Well, that's my sir, <laughs> the patriarch has spoken. The patriarch has most certainly spoken. Okay. Oh, my, that's 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 heavy right there. <clears throat> All right. Well, we have really, uh, we have really been wrestling uh, with this topic of the divine feminine, and mm -hmm. I, I know that when uh, if you are a traditional thinker, when you hear a term like divine feminine, you will you it, it will it will rattle your cage because it's not a language that is commonly posited in the Christian faith. Yet it is a truth that we have often and so often overlooked. In fact, we have avoided the divine feminine because we haven't really understood the feminine aspect of God because the first thing we wanna do is to go into our gender biases rather than trying to uh, unearth or should I say unheaven, mm -hmm. <laughs> not on earth, <laughs> unheaven, you know, th this, this, idea, this idea that God had in mind from the beginning. And so uh, we're, we're going to walk through this. We, we, we got a, to, today, we got a couple more weeks at this. And so I'm not going to rush through it, but we're going to do the best we can. If you have any questions or comments, obviously put them into the chat. If we don't address them tonight, we'll come back and we'll address them on the upcoming week. As we've always said, we're not telling you what, to do, you know, uh, but we're giving you all the tools on how to engage your own thought process when it comes to the kind of things that we're putting out here. All right. The divine feminine. Patriarchy. What? in the world is patriarch. Do you want to address that, uh, Dr. Brown? Would you like to address what patriarchy is? And, and, and uh, what are your, some, your, some of your views about it? Well, let me just say this. My, my sister who started, and you too started this word, the patriarch, you reached and grabbed a, a Western idea of, the, uh, of being male, but I am not male nor female when it comes to this discussion because we're all spiritual beings. And being a spiritual being, I am in a male body, and consequently the idea of patriarch is traditionally used as that which rules and rules with an authority, but patriarch has no more power than the matriarch. And both of those dualism, well, let's say dualism, I'm anti-dualism, and I believe in the oneness of our spirituality. So when we talk about patriarch, we're really speaking of who has the authority over the others, which has no relevance for me. <laughs> okay. Very good. That's, that's my one thing work because I know where that word patriarch goes. It goes into authoritative, it goes into authoritative energy that oppresses that which is not patriarch. Now, that's describe patriarchs. Oh, there's a long list of it defined based on, well, let me just say it like this patriarch. And that whole notion is a dilemma of our own ignorance of our spirituality. Okay. Well, and it was silent. <laughs> okay. 
All right, it's all our ignorance of our own spirituality. Um, let me, right. uh, I'm going to quote something that's in a book. Uh, this book is by a, uh, a professor, a college professor by the name of Beth Allison Barr. And she wrote a book that came out this year called The Making of Biblical Womanhood, How the Subjugation of Women Became Gospel Truth. Now, I'm, I'm going to uh, see if I can find what that cover looks like. Let me pull this up. And then again, I'm going to share my screen so you can kind of see uh, where this quote or quotes that I'm going to share tonight are coming from. Let's see here. While, while you're getting it, um, Dr. Gardner, um, yeah. if we just look at a basic uh, form to append to um, what, and we call him patriarch out of respect of his longevity and the fact that he has a little more mileage than we. So we say that in a um, uh, a position of honor versus a position of uh, governmental oppression. Uh, so you, you, you know, hey, we love you like that, Dr. Brown. But patriarchy, we need to, to look at it as a system. Okay, it's a system. You know, it's I, I'm gonna say it's a system and a spirit, but it's a system of society or a system of government even, in which the father, we see this a lot of times in um, African culture, which the father or the eldest man, we see this also um, in, in uh, ancient Hebraic times biblically, which the father or the eldest male is the head of the family and, 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 and the descent is traced through the male line. It is also a system of society or government in which men hold the power. And I'm gonna say, and the purse, and women are largely excluded from it. Uh, it is, or it can be a society um, like certain tribes or whatever that are based on male patriarchal lines. It has different meaning, uh, particularly in the West, um, as Dr. Brown was saying, it is oppressive. It refer for, when we look at it in terms of what we do and we believe um, here, it refers to male domination, both in the public and in private or familial spheres. Um, patriarchy really kind of describes the power relationship between man and woman. Walby um, uh, uh, describes patriarchy as a system of social structures and practices in which men dominate and oppress and exploit women. That's the one right there. Okay. A, a, a system of social structures and practices in which men dominate, oppress, and exploit women. And when your whole system is based on it, your culture is based on it, your religion and your family systems are based on this, Men can, men can have a patriarchal spirit as, and think they're free. Just like many people say, well, I'm not a racist because I like black people. It's the same thing. Uh, where men say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, 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 a chauvinist or I'm not patriarchal or I'm not, you know, uh, none of that because I have women on my board or I let women in my pulpit. But when it is the prevailing ethos or the prevailing worldview, and we say God said it, then many, many times those attitudes and beliefs are still there, even if some of the practices are not. Okay. That, that's very good. That's very good. Um, wow. Uh, we can see you, Dr. Brown. Uh, uh, are, is your sound on the other device? Can you hear it's us? The, yes, it's on the phone. Okay, so your picture's on the other one and your sound is on this one. All right. Yeah. Okay. Let me um, 
try to share this screen here. And then I'm going to elaborate upon what uh, Dr. Hyman just shared. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the book that I was referring to. The Making of Biblical Womanhood, How the Subjugation of Women Became the Gospel Truth by Beth Allison Barr. And she is a professor, I forgot out of, let me see here. Uh, let me see. Yeah, she's a professor at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, an associate professor of history and associate dean of the graduate school at Baylor University, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, she makes a point here in, in referencing to what, um, let's see, what is patriarchy? And she goes into give basically the same definition that you gave mm -hmm. that has to do what is patriarchy? Historian Judith Bennett explains patriarchy is having three main meanings in English. Male ecclesiastical leaders, such as the patriarch or archbishop of Constantinople in Greek orthodoxy. Two, legal mm -hmm. power of a male household head fathers and husbands, and third, a society that promotes male authority and female submission. Uh, she traces this whole idea back to uh, the Garden of Eden and how, uh, I'm going to quit sharing now, she traces this whole idea back to the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. and how that what happened at the fall was that the woman's desire should be to her husband, that basically that says that's to be the, you know, the infinite role of a woman. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that the infinite role of the man is uh is patriarchal, dominant. And so thereby, I mean, she points out very thing, several things in the book, which I'm not gonna get into right now because we can get into it as we go, as we begin to unpack in, 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 the, in, in the upcoming weeks. The point is, is that what has happened, and we're living in a world where the Bible, at least in our world, the, the Old and New Testament, as, as it were, has a degree of influence in our, in, in our America or in our world. And so what has happened by the promotion of male dominance as the outcome of the fall and female submission as the outcome of the fall, there are two philosophies out there that compete. One is complementarian, and the other is uh, egalitarian. The complementarian viewpoint says, okay, what we have to do is that the woman's role is to always complement the man. The egalitarian role kind of gives the idea that God's design in the beginning was for this, uh, for this flow of masculine and feminine energy to, to fully represent what God looks like. And to deny one and to suppress one, we're only going to get a skewed view of the spiritual God whom we serve. So you have to have the blend of both. And so what has happened in when we have taken stuff from the Bible to, uh, to, uh, to add to our suppression, we are resting the scriptures <laughs> and we're making them to say what we want them to say. And so theologically, you got a belief system that's out there that says that man is always destined to rule and women are always destined to serve. And it's from that premise as to why there is an angst against women preachers, or women apostles, women bishops, 
It's an angst against women pastors, you know, and you find people that will quickly default to this male patriarchal viewpoint because it's coming from a place that has been solidified in scripture, but it's been solidified in a false narrative. That's my two cents. Bishop Hammond, uh, you have to unmute your mic. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Yes, sir. I, I mean, you, you said something about it being systemic. Yes. This thing is so systemic, we can't get away from it. It's everywhere. It, it is. It's just, it's, it's, it's as pervasive as racism, genderism, classism, all of them from the same demon. And they have the same benefits. And those benefits, again, are power, privilege, and the purse. Wow. You know, it's it's that position of power. And and the bad thing is, both in Judaism, <clears throat> some sects of it, and in Christianity, this Genesis narrative has been used um kind of to, to cement, if you will, the moral, the the intellectual and and psychological depravity of women. In fact. We use it to, um, I guess, as an argument that the woman is inherently inferior. Even when we get to New Testament stuff that's basically borrowed um, from many Old Testament scriptures, it talks about, you know, the woman being the weaker vessel. We'd have made that something in terms of rank and power, where it really is only talking about her physicality. Uh, you know, where in most cases, a male, all things equal, is physically stronger than a female. But we have made even that scripture, uh, you know, about the woman being the weaker vessel. And uh, so many people have problems with biblical interpretation of biblical translation because it appears that it supports patriarchy. And if we understand we're talking about ancient cultures, some of them did, many of them did not. And some of those lines have been erased so as to keep the woman in their place as a slave, just like to keep the Negro in his or her place as a slave. It's the same demon and it's the same system and it is so inherent in the culture that many men do not know that they're sexist. They just can't believe that, but how, how, how are you not? When it's laced in everything, many women don't know that they have succumbed to the subordination of women and then they become oppressive to other women who are free. It's the same exact system as racism, same demon. But I concur, uh, my brothers, if we do not allow uh, for knowledge and wisdom and the functionality of the divine feminine, at best, we have an oppressive view of God and, and this other piece or aspect a realm, if you will, of, of divinity, we are void of, and so we really don't know God like we think because we have shut down a whole dimension of God's isness. That's my half a cent worth. Okay. Uh, before I have you to comment on that, Dr. Brown, let me share something that's also in this book that's from a study. And one of the things we like to bring to chairs, Oops. Bring, um, truth to the table, we want you to know that, you know, 
we're standing on the shoulders of scholars. Absolutely. We're not talking out the side of our neck or we're not speaking from our soapbox and our, of our angst and flesh only. But these are some of the things that we have ran across that we've observed and we have their voices out there that concur with this truth. And so uh, let me again share a piece of this and I got it highlighted. Can y'all see this okay? Yeah. Okay. It says American evangelicalism provides a case in point. In 2017, Barna's study focused on the perception of women and power in American society, drew evidence from three polls to compare attitudes toward women across several demographics, including gender, age, political preference, and religious identity, evangelical, Protestant, Catholic, and practicing Christian. The study found that evangelicals <laughs> are the most hesitant group in supporting women's work outside of the home. Only 52% are comfortable with the future possibility of women more uh, of, of more women than men in the workforce, a percentage more than 20 percent, 20 points below that of the American uh, general American population. Evangelicals also express the, the most discomfort with females with a female CEO. The study also found that evangelicals are least comfortable with women as pastors, 39 percent. Now, this is from 2017. A study then. For evangelicals, these attitudes are connected. Colon. Limiting women's spiritual authority goes hand in hand with limiting women's economic power. There as, it is. The, as the study puts it, these results are, quote unquote, perhaps due to a more traditional interpretation of women's roles as primary caregivers in the home. Evangelical teachings that subordinate women within the home and inside the walls of the church influence attitudes about women in the workplace or considered within Bennett's framework, male ecclesiastical authority and male household authority exist within the broader cultural practices that subordinate women to men. Patriarchy doesn't stay confined to one sphere. Mm -hmm. So that's just a supporting, that it's not just confined, it's all over the place. Absolutely. And you find that, you know, evangelicals kind of support that. They are the, are the ones that are more adamant to have this kind of female resistance and, and uh, in authority and so on and so forth. And so uh, uh, what do you have to say about any of the stuff we've talked about, Dr. Brown? Well, you all have kind of helped me to conceptualize <laughs> what fear is, because that's what you're talking about. Everything you have described and everything my sister presented, the bishop presented, presented an, a, a, a narrative of fear. Fear in regard to how she expressed it was the behavior and even the interpretations and the wordings are all engrossed with fear. And I use it another way, the fear to love and the love to fear. Our Christianity, in my experiences, the systemic, I want to use that word, the systemic is, is manifested by the energy of fear. And at the same time, I always, I even asked my dad years ago, many years ago, before he decided to leave the planet, was Satan a man or a woman? Wow. Was Satan feminine or masculine? And my dad said, <clears throat> he said, I don't know. He said, but it was left up to me. I think he was both. <clears throat> and I said, okay, dad. <clears throat> but, in reality, 
what I've been listening to is what fear and how it is so successful within our psychic and by uh, Dr. Hyman being in psychology, I always push her in, in respect to looking at fear and what it makes us become illusional, mm -hmm. illusional to loving this fear and fearing to love. Okay. All right. Comments, Dr. Hyman? Uh, I, I agree. Um, you know, anytime there is an, an oppression, uh, for me, uh, there's, there's a pathology there. It, you know, the pathology may be a collective pathology um, in, laced in the collective unconscious of a people um, who actually fear who they oppress. The reason you keep something suppressed is so you can control it so that it never overpowers or overtakes you. And so it is based and rooted in fear. Um, even as we look at the, the Genesis um, 316 narrative, um, both, uh, at least when we talk about rabbinical people, we're talking about the Ashkenazim, uh, you know, them, them, them Jews. Um, but, but most of them, even uh, biblical scholars looking at that uh, um, 316 uh, um, Genesis, that's interesting, you know, because you got a John 316 oh and a Genesis 316. Ain't oh. that interesting? Wow. Uh, you know, how, how this is redemptive here. But, it, that's, that's, that. but, but looking at it, it's really looking at it through an, an, uh, um, an Aristotle type of lens. We're looking at this text even through a Greek lens versus a Hebrew lens. It's traditional Aristotelian uh, type of lens that used by both the um, ancient rabbis and church fathers to describe the woman in Genesis 3 as a seductress and the man as legitimate authority over the woman's corrupt nature. And just like with the slave, the reason a slave needs to get saved is because he is so inherently immoral that only the salvation of the oppressor can help control uh, his, his immoral, brutish, animalistic characteristics. And it is the same demon um, that is used with the woman. She is so immoral. She is such a seductress. She is the reason uh, a man is, is morally weak. She is a reason the man is morally and sexually uh, weak. It's, it's always the woman. And so the woman has to get saved now because only the master salvation is able to suppress her and help her to suppress uh, her inherently immoral, weak, oversexed, seductive nature. And so it presents her um, in a light so that, and, and the truth be told, I hear this a lot as a black woman, uh, uh, gentlemen, you know, uh, I'm in a, you know, men are intimidated by you. Uh, oh, you, oh, you, you, you intimidating. Oh, you know, and so women have to dumb down. Women have to silence themselves. Women have to mute their own voices uh, because we're in a system that has muted her voice except when uh, the voice uh, 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 is the impetus for gain. Uh, of the male or gain economically of a system, uh, and it's 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 a demon, uh, so to speak, because of the way we are presented. But it's interesting, you know. Well, you know, how many you you get, you know, you got all them degrees, and you know, you outspoken, and oh, you so bold. And no, I'm not. I'm a human being who has found her genderless voice within my gender and become comfortable with it. Why do we say men are intimidated by this? 
Dr. Brown has said it. It is rooted, the need to control is rooted in fear or sometimes in ignorance because I don't understand um, the inner workings of the female. I don't understand the divine feminine. I don't understand how she could have so much power, but I'm the man and I don't. I don't understand. And so um, he is exactly right. It's rooted in fear and it's also rooted in, in uh, uh, ignorance, a willful ignorance, because I don't want to ever unleash you because I really feel so weak um, because I've been put in position. It's just like, oh God, I wish I had time to look for it. It's just like um, in Ecclesiastes 10. Let me see if I can find that real quick. And I'll show you exactly what I mean uh, when, when I talk about this. Give me one second to see, uh, can I put my hand on uh, that? And I'm gonna show you a thing that he said is, uh, it's crazy under the sun. That's right. I, I think it's go to the eleven or go to the sixth chapter, cause you hit you hit the nail on the head when you said Ecclesiastes. Okay, let me see. Uh, let me see, um, because because this is going to talk about um, it's going to talk about position mm -hmm. that's not even earned. It's mm -hmm. going to talk about power and prestige that's mm -hmm. not really earned. Um, and we'll find out. Um, I'm still looking forward to trying to get it here on this phone. We'll find out that it's the same system <clears throat> um, that we use here. Uh, let me see. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it kind of starts like this. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left hand. Left hand doesn't have any skill or dexterity, unless you're left-handed. Um, yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by his way, uh, the wis his wisdom failed him. Um, if the spirit of a ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifies great offense. I could go into that, and that would take the rest of the night. He says, but there's an evil which I have seen under the sun, an error which proceedeth from the ruler or the archy or the monarch or the patriarch or the Caucasian arc, okay? Folly is set in great dignity. That means fools sit in seats of authority. Immature people sit in high places because of who they are, not what they know, not what they've earned, not what they've worked for, all right? The, and the rich is set in a low place. He says, I've seen servants um, upon horses, servants on horses and princes, the real royalty walk in the earth as servants. The servants or the people who are dumb and ignorant are the ones riding on horses. But the real royalty who are stewards of the earth, stewards of this, or the people who have built this country are um, still walking on the earth. And so what the idea is, is that because of uh, positioning, you riding on a horse, a horse is, is like a Bentley for us. It's, it's a royal thing. Uh, poor folks walk, folks with the money on horses. Mm. And so, so it is with the slave system. All of the princes who have built this country are walking on the ground like slaves, while the people who don't know nothing and ain't done nothing, simply because they who they are, are riding on horses in luxury. And so we've been talking about this is a season of a divine switcheroo. So the same thing happens with the male. So when you have males riding on horses, but women slaving in the kitchen, Women who keep the culture, they're, they're the keepers of the culture. They're the birthers of everything that comes from the eternal realm into the earth realm. Can't come without a womb. But these princesses <coughs> are uh, walking on foot, they, as they call it, barefoot and pregnant. Listen to the language. Uh, uh, you, you know, you're a housewife. 
I mean, listen to the language. So those who are making it happen are those who are in their royalty, are stripped of their royalty, and they're walking as slaves. Those men, simply because they have gonads that look the way they look, get to ride on horses with privilege and power and prestige when the greater work is done by the people walking on the ground. And so it is a whole system that says, because I'm male, I'm supposed to be up here. And because I'm, I'm privileged, I, I don't have to know anything. I don't have to earn it. I don't have to go through no processes. I don't have to be, you know, I, none of that. I ain't got to go through no process and be mentored and, 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 and all of that. I don't have to do that because I'm a man. I don't have to answer your question. I'm a man. I don't have to address nothing you saying to me, woman, because I'm a man. It is people riding on. They're fools in seats of authority while people down here on the ground is making it work. It's the same system, whether it's sexism, whether it's racism, or whether it's classism. And it is built on fear and ignorance and the presupposition that because I look like physically what I look like, I deserve and have earned the right to ride on horses while you, gal, walk on foot and your my every wish is your command. Wow. Yeah, there's a lot that I can say right there, but I, I'm going to have to control myself. Don't I'm, control yourself, sir. Uh, 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 there's a lot that I can say right there about riding on horses, but you, you know, wow. Audience, you guys are listening at some things that are just not only in the voices of the African-American women, but that's voices right. from women, period. This is not just something that's only coming from the voice of an African-American experience, but there are other voices that have spoken to the very same thing and have talked about it. I, I want to um, I want to share where to go. Man. But 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 brethren, Wait. haven't you heard about you know well you know yeah, she intimidated well they intimidated by you okay right in timid fear Okay. Internal. The fear is not coming from the thing outside. Right. In timid. The intimidation is internal. They don't have nothing to do with the woman. They don't have nothing to do with with uh, white people being intimidated by the greatness. And that's in them. It's internal. Internal. Okay. All right. Somebody, we got a little echo going on. Let's let me share this real quick. Okay. Alice Matthews, theologian and former uh, academic dean at Gordon Cornwall Theological Seminary. She explains the biblical perspective of the birth of patriarchy so well in a book, Gender Roles and the People of God. Where we got this? Oh. Listen to what she says. Okay. In Genesis 3.16, God speaking to the woman, where we first see hierarchy in human relationships. Hierarchy was not God's will for the first pair, but was imposed when they chose to disregard his command and eat the forbidden fruit. We can agree or, not, or not, not agree on this. Adam was now subject to his source, the ground, even as Eve was now subject to her source, Adam. This was the moment, this was the moment of birth of patriarchy as a result of their sin. Man was now the master of the woman, and the ground was now master of the man, contrary to God's original intention in creation. Patriarchy 
wasn't what God wanted. Patriarchy was a result of human sin. What was new to me that night, rather old, theologically speaking, everyone already knew that patriarchy was a result of the fall. Stanley Gundry, a former president of the Evangelical Theological Society, states that matter of factly in his 2010 essay, the patriarchy that continues to appear in the biblical text is a mere accommodation to the reality of the times and culture. It is not a reflection of the divine ideal for humanity. Patriarchy is created by people, not ordained by God. Now, this is what some theologians are saying out there, and we can agree or disagree with some of their, uh, some of their statements there. But the fact of the matter is this fear thing, that I mean, fear is, is economically advantageous. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, oh, okay. Uh, uh, unmute your mic, Dr. Brown. Uh, on the phone, on, the, on your phone. Okay, unmute your mic on your a laptop. There you All go. right. Yeah. Ooh, the technology is awesome. Go ahead. We missed whatever you said. What, what did you just say? I just said the technology is awesome. No, about, uh, about the fear part. You know, we would, we would kind of, that is profitable. Yeah, uh, yeah, fear is profitable. Uh, mm -hmm. Because what do you fear? you fear? You fear losing. You always want to win. And when you talk about economics, you fear to go in the red and want to be in the black. Isn't it interesting how the color changes? You're, you're in the black when you're doing good, and you're in the red when you're doing bad. How did that happen? Fear creates an energy mm -hmm. to, to oppress and to let yourself not be suppressed because you're always fearful of losing. Now we have had in our tradition, you get no gain if you don't have any pain. Well, yeah. So mm -hmm. from the operation of fear, you, 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 you fall in love with the fear for the pain so you can have the gain. And then that's where pain plays off in your love for it. Now I know that's kind of kooky the way I said it. No, it's, mm -hmm. no, it's, that's heavy. You know, you know, it's heavy. You know, I mean, Doctor Hyman, Doctor Hyman hit another word, which ignorance is an interesting energy, and it's an energy that you can become addicted or infected with ignorance. So much so, you never get an opportunity to reach your own divine awareness or, let's say, to reach your soul consciousness. And as my ancestor used to say, I'm doing some soul searching. And they were talking about going within yes. to find their relationship with the divine father, which they could realize me and the father or mother or me and the divine are one. So I am divine. So that kind of goes back to what we said last week about when we talk about we 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 uh, fear oneness. Yes, and we love division. We love hierarchy because it means that somebody's up and somebody's down, and everybody's striving to be up, and we don't want to be down. In fact, one person said. That the best way to help the poor is not to be one of them. I mean, you know, it, it's those kind of thoughts like that of somebody is above the other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that comes from a hierarchical, patriarchal construct. Or should I say hierarchical, patriarchal paradigm? Well, you can add to it. It comes from a selfishness. 
That's a thing. It comes from an egotistical selfishness because we all have been taught or it's been said to us, what is the first law of nature? Self-preservation. <clears throat> I, 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 I concur. Yes, I, I concur that partially at the center of this, because we, we are, we're talking systemic. That means it's in the laws. It's in the government. It's in the economic powers. It is in the corporate structures. It is in the education or the miseducation. It is in the religion. It is in the psyche. It is in the culture. And when you talk about um, uh, dealing with ignorance, you're talking about uh, shedding truth at all of those levels. And most people don't want to do the work because it's so systemic and they feel like one or two little individuals trying to destroy a system. Um, one of the things from the thing that you just read, Dr. Gardner, is said that this uh, patriarchy, as you said, whether we agree with all that text or not, we can agree that patriarchy develops as a result of the quote, fall, all right? It's something even wrong with the punishment uh, because it lists the ground as Adam's source, although um, the second Genesis narrative says, and he called their name together, Adam, which means humankind. That's not the name of a white dude. It's, it's humankind. Um, but even as this author has said, this scholar has said, um, Adam's source is the earth, is the soil. The source of, I mean, even while he writing about it. While he writing while about he it. Writing about it he's That's why I put it out there. The same structure. Mm -hmm. Adam's source is the soil. The woman's source is Adam. That ain't even in the text. And, <laughs> and so even while they're trying to deconstruct something, you see uh, the, 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 the toxicity, the interwovenness of that whole system, even in their psyche. But I would like to submit what I do believe is true, that patriarchy is a result of sin. Not just sin then, it is the result of sin now. And it is sin. It's the result of sin that perpetuates sin. And wherever you have perpetuating sin, eventually you're going to see structures crumble. And everywhere where women are suppressed and women are subjugated, you begin to see the economical power and even the political power of that nation begin to crumble because we are acting in, living in, practicing in, a sinful paradigm that excommunicates God. When maleness or when a male uh, dishonors, disregards, reduces, minimizes women or femininity, then he must resort to a moral kind of religious relationship with God because there can be no, as we talked about today, gnosis, uh, gnoso. There can be no um, knowledge of God that is purely experiential because they have completely X out a whole dimension of God to the divine feminine. So when you shut women down, you also just shut access to certain uh, uh, dimensions or experiences with God down. This is why women tend to be more, it, 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 you know, I know some of it may have to do with the way the brain has evolved, but women tend to be more spiritual than men because they are the oppressed and they know to honor God in his maleness. Uh, and our men tend to be more philosophical, more intellectual in terms of uh, their walk, more rational in terms of their walk with God. Their intuitiveness has been dulled, 
even as a people of the diaspora, their ability to see prophetically has been dull. Um, Apostle Winnie Hamilton says one of the Africans told her that, that um, Africans are the eyes of the body. This is why we can see. But when you make God male, you make God's son male, and you make God's son God, the whole thing is iconically, and they hear white male, iconically, it is to train you that anything that does not look like that is inferior. It's sinful, it's the result of sin, and it perpetuates sin. And we are living in the consequence, even as an African-American people, we are living in the consequence of that sin for the way we have treated our own women, period. Wow. She, you, you, you used the word there, Dr. Hyman, and you went right through it real quick but you're gonna to have to work on it on your next presentation. Oh, because no. one, <laughs> one thing you use, you use the word intuitive. The woman, the woman energy has a stronger intuitive consciousness. Now I'm saying intuition is the mind of the soul. And the woman, you tell a woman, I'm the old grandmama and great grandmama say that there's something within. I can't explain it. Come on. But at the same time, I know what it is, and I and I see and I know. Those old great grandmamas mm -hmm. had intuitive capacities that the, the male was operating from his own kind of experiences. But the 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 that that woman who carries an embryo inside her body has to have certain kind of qualities physically and whatever other words you want to use to be able to manage to birth in both male and female. So That's there is there is inside that dynamic the presence of an energy force related not to the five senses, but to the sense of the soul, which is intuition. Yes. Intuition has got to be more defined in regard, even the women who are rebelling, they are more successful when they do it intuitively and not intellectually. Because intellect is one thing of the ego, intuitiveness is another thing of the soul that's of my the, one thing. yes sir of the soul absolutely so now we you know <laughs> lord have mercy you guys are just going in the night you know i'm sitting on the sideline <laughs> but anyway this is all good uh when you think of it in terms of how everything has been constructed mm -hmm. The woman has been ordained and has been given the power to birth male and female. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just use another word? Use another word because power, we'll talk about that sometimes later. The woman has been given authority. Okay. The woman has been given authority to birth. Yeah, I, I, and I want you to play with that. You don't have to do it this night. But the woman has been given authority like the man has authority, but the problem becomes another question. Okay, we're gonna deal and with the it. woman has authority over, over the life and the maturing and the nurturing of both male and female. That's an authority, but that authority is driven by the intuition and not the intellectual systemic, all that other stuff. Okay. That's my, that's where I am. That's where I am. Okay. All right. And I'm glad I have a woman feminine energy in this team because she holds an authority that we've got to learn how to respect. My Lord. All right. My Lord. All right. My Lord. All right. My Lord. And I think there's a fear there. Oh God, this man here. But I think there's a fear there. Um, I recall to your point, 
I recall um, once I was having a conversation um, with another male pastor, um, you know, Dr. So-and-so, I'm not sure where that doctor came from, y'all, but the Dr. So-and-so, and, and um, you know, tall, dark, good-looking, suave, if, they, if the old folks say suave, debonair, um, had a much, much larger church than I, and um, he had a, a event, and uh, it was snowing and whatnot. I threw my folks in the car, my leaders in the, in the van, and we went to, to that church, and we sat in the back, and when I walked in, I just sat down in the back, and almost the whole service stopped. Like, okay. Um, so finally, he had to give into it. He said, "Oh, okay. Um, um, Apostle Hyman is here because uh, you know ain't nothing gonna go on until we acknowledge this." Now I'm sitting in the back. I just sit on the back row with my people. And um, you know, he calls me up and everything. And um, you know, I have have some words later on. And I asked him um, why he made that comment. And he says, "You know, when you walked in." He said, it's almost like I wanted to pay obeisance to you because of the authority you carry. He said, but then I've thought about it. Ain't no woman going to come in here in my pulpit and I'm going to pay obeisance to. See, that that the instinct was there. The acknowledgement of it, like, okay, the whole service is interrupted because a, a presence, not the person, a, but the, the presence that the person carried, the presence walked in. And because of this authority, I, he said, it's like I almost wanted to pay obeisance to it. Then I thought about it. Ain't no woman coming in here and I'm going to pay obeisance to it. And so here is a man who intuitively and instinctively recognized exactly what you said. But because of that church system and how he is wired and that ego um, wherein I would appear to be weak, I would appear to be whipped, I would appear to be all these other things, then I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to make some little terse comment uh, and, and then have her come up and sit down and give her uh, uh, something to say later. And, and then take me in the office and ask me to unpeel everything I said because uh, he didn't have a capacity <laughs> he didn't have a capacity for it at the moment. Um, and so this is exactly where the fear is. It's just like being um, uh, uh, when our Caucasian brothers and sisters come into the full realization of the sinfulness and heinous nature of, of uh, uh, barbaric nature of racism. And they come into the knowledge of it and they say, I want to help turn this around. I want to help justice. Just like they're called nigger lovers. Um, they, they, they are, there's a fear there that there's an insurrection going to rise up against the rest. And many of our men know instinctively and intuitively how God rests in whoever the person is, uh, male or female. Um, and they, they, they are afraid from other males that they're going to get labeled or ostracized. And so out of fear, again, they override conviction and continue to perpetuate it, um, oftentimes uh, becoming more fierce with the misogynistic stuff. And, and so we are, we are gonna have to learn how to adjust, to recognize, however God shows up in whomever, and we got to pay obeisance to it. You know, that's absolutely true. I mean, I mean, that's some strong stuff there. And, and audience, we, you need to let what you've heard in the last 10 minutes to sink in. You know, I would encourage you to replay this, you know, go back and look this over again and let what you've heard in the last 10 minutes to really sink in. See, one of the things that, and I can talk about evangelicals because I did my doctoral dissertation on evangelicals. So I think that I'm a semi-authority on that. But the one thing that evangelicals, they the way they voice their fear, watch this, when they knew the truth 
about racism, the way they voiced their fear was in silence. They didn't say nothing. Which makes them conspirators. Yeah, didn't say nothing. Which in essence, you agree. You don't want to speak out against it. You are in agreement with it. You know, you, you, there's no middle ground. You're either for or against. And so, you know, and so you, you got that. You got that as a problem because now my silence has sided with the enemy. My silence has sided. My silence is in concert with the sin. Not mine. And now my silence becomes the sin. My, my silence becomes the sin. And so we've been walking around here sinful, thinking that we're sanctified. Ooh. Full of sin. Because mm -hmm. why? We've allowed the man of sin, huh? The man of sin, that image that's been created, the man of sin, to keep us tied to that pole. And we won't let it go. Women are born into this world. They have the power to, they have the authority, as Dr. Brown corrected me, they have the authority to give, give birth to both male and female, yet they're, when a woman is born into this world, she's born automatically into a suppressive system. That's right. The, woman, the person that gave her, that had the authority to give birth to her, can, male or female, life giver, yet born into a system that already oppresses that aspect of life. And so therefore they grow up and they grow up into a society that has a skewed view as to what the paradigm of God is supposed to look like. Yes, sir. We have a false paradigm. Yes, indeed. We have a false construct that only is shaped in the image of the male gender. To deduce God down to being a man. And God's not a man. The scripture last time I read it, it said God's a spirit. And so if God's a spirit, that means we're spirit. And the fullness of God cannot be fully understood or fully appreciated or fully manifested without both energies. I didn't yes. say both. Hear what I'm saying? Sometimes we get the flesh and the spirit mixed up. Yes, we say, sir. We can say both genders, but when we say both energies, we've gone from flesh to spirit. That there's a spiritual dimension of God that can only be represented in love through both the masculine and the feminine energy in concert, in union. And when we don't want that, when e see his ego kicked in. The guy you was talking about? Absolutely. He says to do something with that, but his ego kicked in. And what does ego mean, Dr. Brown? Edging God out. Edging God out. It, it went into self-preservation mode. Absolutely. That fear of, of preserving the self, preserving the image, preserving the comfort. Preserve the at the expense of receiving the grace that just walked in your house. Right. That could have been beneficial to all of us. Everybody got robbed in that moment. Not just me. Everybody got robbed in that moment when we refused to give in to what we intuitively knew because we would rather self-preserve and save our image than honor God however he, she shows up. Even the concept of God as father takes us into, if you're not male, you have no preeminence. If you are male, you are equal in some form to God and all of the rest of humanity, particularly those who carry estrogen, must serve your needs, must serve your desires, must serve your purpose, 
must serve your assignment, must serve your sex, must serve your food, must serve your cleaning of your house, must serve your children, must serve your church. It is slavery and it needs to stop. Well, we're about at our time. Dr. Brown, you want to give us a closing remark? Because we can't, we can't say it all tonight. <laughs> we got more to say. Especially well, you, you, uh, I, I'm sure you have more to say. I, I, uh, with this technology, which I'm still trying to learn, the other thing is, and I, 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 I put this one on Dr. Hyman. She knows I like, to, I like to throw some things at her. But one of the dynamics of the struggle with the fear and the consciousness is where sex has become the authoritative energy that has put women and men at odds, but at the same time has created another nuance of what I call abuse and oppression. My Lord. Am I right, sister? Yes, sir. And maybe we will use this as a launching pad. Uh, I don't know if our audience is ready, Dr. Gardner, for the thing we talked about. Um, in relation to how uh, we see um, sex and how it becomes um, a tool of domesticating women. Very true, and how it's a money maker. Well, we know. Oh it's yes, money. shake your money it's maker. Money. Shake <laughs> your money maker. See. Yeah. Here we, we money maker. All right. Well, audience, I trust that you have been stirred your thoughts. If you got any hair left, you know, <laughs> you know, we trust that this has been something for you to consider. You've been watching the doctors are in. Pray for us. Come back and support us. We'll see you guys next time we're together. God bless. <laughs>